And we back 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 and we back. We're back today, guys, talking about the art of impossible again. This time we're going to talk about part one motivation. Please read the book before you watch this video, unless you don't listen to rules, then I can't control you there, okay? Let's get started talking about the main takeaways that I have from reading part one, which I just completed today. So if I can complete it today, you can complete it today, okay? That's it, that's the grit that we're talking about today. That's the intrinsic fire, okay? That sits inside of you. We want that intrinsic fire to burn hotter. So let's get started today. Yeah. I'm inspired. Yeah. I'm inspired. Yeah. Hey there, guys, what's happening? My name is Sumed Chatterjee from the Flow Zone Academy, and I'm a flow state guide, which means that I help you feel better and perform better. Today, we're talking about The Art of the Impossible by Stephen Kotler. And today is all about part one, which is all about motivation. Okay. Chapter starts out by saying, we want our biology to work for us and not against us, okay? There are certain neurochemicals that are being released that are helping us move forward or have some kind of an outcome. Then it goes on to talk about curiosity and how curiosity doesn't feel like work. There's an effortlessness to curiosity because it transforms work into play. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Yay, yay. So when you turn work into play, it becomes the infinite game now. It's like you've just logged into World of Warcraft or whatever, and now you're in it. Now you're in the zone. With curiosity, you've just plugged in to the game that is life. So when we have no other option, our motivation or that fuel has got to start from drive. Now there's two main essential drives as we know, survival, reproduction. We can either fight over dwindling resources or we can start to get creative and make our own resources. So this book says that elite performers stack, okay? Which means to cultivate, align, amplify, and deploy. Elite performers know what is fundamentally required for their physical energy and fundamental, meaning it's fun to the mental, okay? I got that from MJ's post about, I forgot who the comedian was, but yeah. So they're extrinsic drivers, which are things on the outside world, right? Like a cer certification or, you know, the, well, the main big three ones is money, fame, and sex, right? Money translates to food, clothing, shelter. Fame translates to access to more resources. And sex is the only way to win the evolutionary game of survival. That's what basically the extrinsic factors are. Now, intrinsic factors are internal, okay? Which means these are like installing like behavior traits almost. But they are the emotional forces behind these extrinsic factors, right? This would be things like curiosity, meaning, purpose, passion, autonomy. Autonomy, meaning you're in charge of your own life. Right? Purpose, finding meaning in life. And passion, like you don't have to put much effort into passion because your neurochemistry helps you. Your adrenaline and dopamine help you drive your focus for your passion. You see? So this is what I mean by your biology working for you and not against you. Once the extrinsic drivers fade, the intrinsic drivers take over. It's just a natural progress. So I just got some yerba mate cooler coming in. It's awesome, man. It's awesome. I just tasted it amazing the evolutionary strategy takes over right it comes down to neurochemistry which produces neuroelectricity and i know that there's a lot of science here and embedded studies and it might confuse you for some people don't get overwhelmed man just read along and start absorbing this information it's really really powerful okay i'm gonna try explain some of it to the best of my ability of what i found but it's really, really powerful, right? How our neurochemicals help us to attain flow and specific goals. And a neuron that's filled up fires and wires together, right? So the neuron kind of, the, the way they describe it is like a water wheel effect where it just goes on to the next neuron. Chemicals are basically telling us do more of this and less of that, more of this, less of that. 
and that's how it forms certain you know patterns or habits as it goes on our systems drive us so let's say we feel lust that's a drive for procreation we want to care and nurture which is a drive to protect and educate the young or the youth there's two drive systems at play here one is play or social engagement which is the first one these are things that we used to do as children right wrestling jumping running dancing Play teaches us lessons. The example given in this book is, oh, might doesn't make it right, okay? These little lessons, these little morals that we get as children growing up. And so that's one of the drivers we get as adults too. We don't forget play. We don't forget to socially engage and just be in our own worlds, right? And so that is one of our core drivers. Another drive is obviously our reward system, okay? So for our need for survival and basically resources that we need for survival, okay? So this is the process that I share with all my clients and I really highly recommend you do this. Okay, highly, highly recommend because this is the, the formula that you really need. You want to start with curiosity. Then it goes to your passion. Then it gets to your purpose. Okay, so 25 things you're most curious about. And the way you want to really think about this question on how you know what am i most curious about you want to think if you had a spare weekend and you could read books on this topic what would you read or if you were attending lectures on this topic or listening to podcasts on this topic or watching movies on this topic or listening to experts talk about this topic okay or talking to an expert about this topic right like there's so many things that you could be doing to get more curious so that, that's what the curiosity is really getting you to do, is to play and engage and make mistakes and have fun and, and learn, okay? So you gotta be specific about this curiosity list, okay? You can't just write food, okay? We used to have this, uh, this student in high school, right? It's just like, food, okay? That's all he used to say. But instead of food, you wanna say, that, like the example they gave in the book, right? Grasshoppers can become the next fuel source in the next 10 years. Wow, that's way more specific than just food. You have gotta get detailed about this because this is your passion that you're getting into. This is a passion that you're creating. So if you just write, oh, I like working out, that's not, no, you don't just like working out. You like the biomechanics of lifting that makes you feel like uh, Hercules. Oh, okay, now we're, now we're getting somewhere. We're getting more specific. Okay, now really get specific about your curiosity. That's the important aspect of this. Then you wanna hunt for the intersections. You wanna find the overlaps, the overlays. You wanna find the sweet spots, the flow states between all of these, okay? What are the three to four different topics or themes that keep repeating in your curiosity list? That's the next step. You wanna go through and be almost like color coded, like what are the top three most commonly occurring ones or top four if you have a difficulty with that. Once you have that, you have like a top three or top four passions, now you can start reading about these topics, watching you know videos about these topics, learning more and getting amped up, getting that passion fueled. Podcasts, videos, articles, books. Now you're going public with it next. You're going public with it and sharing it with the world and seeing their reaction to this information, right? You're going, hey, Listen, I got something to say. Like me on these YouTube videos, I'm like, hey, hey, listen, I've got something to say, okay? And I'm speaking my truth right now. Oh, that feels good, right? So the social reinforcement of going public will reinforce your creations and get you more motivated. This is why I tell my clients, like post about your stuff, post about your journey, just share it out into the world. Who cares what people think? It's not important, it's you sharing and being that that free flowing passionate being again because your passions are meant to be shared and that social engagement is a way you hack your neurochemicals to get you even more focused and give you that positive reinforcement okay so purpose alters the brain decreases reactivity in the amygdala which translates to less stress and more resilience it also guards against that self-rumination it takes our internal thought self-rumination to other rumination in a sense not rumination but other thinking right thinking about others more than just you 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 because purpose is about a cause it's about a movement it's some it's a concept that's grander than you which leads to the selflessness of flow right 
It's like I'm doing something for the community now. Now it's becoming a purpose uh, slowly, right? It's basically about getting outside of you, right? Purpose is something of a concept that is grander than you. It basically leaves you with the feeling of selflessness in flow state, right? Where you're getting less about the self rumination, but internal to an external focus. And you start actually focusing on other people and like, how can I help others? And like, how can I make the world a better place and all these other concepts when it comes down to purpose. So then it goes on to discover the full extrinsic track. There's a sparrow right outside my window as I'm saying this. Autonomy is the desire for freedom. It's doing what you're doing by choice. Not because you're forced or coaxed into it or your parents told you or your teachers told you to do it, that you're doing it, but you're doing it from the love, the passion. It's like, you know, it's a natural inclination because it was your choice. You decided. Okay, you were the choice point. To spend, uh, according to this book, we need to spend 20% of time in developing autonomy. 50% of Google's largest products came out of 20% of their time. They worked eight hours a week with their passion recipes, and that's how they made the greatest products with the greatest amount of revenue. According to Aristotle, goals are big drivers for change in the world. So of course our brains hold seven bits of information, right? And the shortest time to discriminate one set of bits from another is one eighteenth of a second. So that means three people talking to us were already maxed out. That was wild for me to read and, and find out actually. That that actually puts it into context how, how we really need to engage into different things and we can't be so distracted. Like that is not going to help us with the art of the impossible, right? So motivation launches the peak performance. Launch pad, okay? Goal setting defines the path. Okay, carves the path, defines it. Grit moves you forward despite all odds and obstacles. People with less grit have more of what we call resting state activity, so more of a sedentariness. So we know certain things, like they spoke about willpower, how it erodes as the day goes on, how we got to do what Brian Tracy says and eat the ugly frog first thing in the morning, right? Do the, do the thing, do the thing that you most resist and understand that fear is a call to action. And this is what I've been talking about, guys, right? For a while now, that fear is your call to action. If you are a peak performer, you understand that fear, you gotta make that your playmate. So then it goes on to talk about growth mindset. Live and learn, that's the growth mindset, okay? Wins and lessons, baby. Wins and lessons, okay? There's more flow as a result of this mindset, which is really cool. Passion's original statement was, Get, get obsessed and stay obsessed. But it's more about that mentality, according to Stephen, of get curious and stay curious, because that's that fuel for that passion to stay alive, right? Growth mindset actually forces the brain to flip the script in order for you to actually view the pain as a pleasure, to find comfort in the uncomfortable. And dopamine actually cements that growth mindset into place by stacking these little wins. I love this little statement here. The ecstasy of flow redeems the agony of passion. I love that, man. That is so profound and beautiful. Word of flow state is such a big reward. It, it redeems itself for all the effort, all the, you know, the toil, the, the hard work we put in to, to refining something, the mastery, the passion, the, you know, the purpose, the autonomy, all these intrinsic drives and motivators. Get active, measure your progress, adopt a growth mindset, stay in that pocket of that challenge skills ratio, because that's one way to say mastery. One way to say mastery is the challenge skills ratio as a flow trigger. So for days when nothing seems possible or you're having a bad day or something, try a low energy grit exercise. So just like maybe 100 push-ups split up during the day. Just do that, you know, just you need that grit to say I'm done, I've finished it, I've gone through it and just do it, you know, like, like that is one of the best solutions to get that motivation on days where you don't feel like it or you know you're in that state where you're like ah, i don't really want to move or do anything there might be also other health reasons obviously like sleep uh, nutrition obviously all these other factors but it's mainly the neurochemicals that we have to start to understand like are we giving ourselves that active rest as well right and he talks about this too positive self-talk helps your resilience positive self-talk expands your energy negative self-talk constricts your energy. Actually doing some work with the emotion code, I actually had a healer 
do some energy work on me uh, yesterday. And yeah, today I'm feeling quite different around that energy. Obviously, I'm still low in my... After a healing session, you're always kind of low in your energy a little bit. But I'm integrating quite well, I believe, as I'm starting to feel into this new timeline shift that's just happened. I feel like we've just gone through a timeline shift right now. Uh, I don't know if that's accurate to say, but if you have a similar feeling, give me a thumbs up. And of course he gets into the reason affirmations don't work. You know, if you're working at Walmart and you're like, I'm a millionaire, I'm a millionaire. Yeah, you're not gonna freaking cement that in your brain because you don't believe it. So you gotta believe it. And I do agree with you, Stephen, here, but I do want to also introduce to the audience an alternative of priming their affirmation. So saying things to themselves, like you said, which is 100% true, but then saying things to yourself, which are 90% true or 80% true to then kind of let those little affirmations leak in to your life. Because it's all about that growth mindset, right? Leaning into the impossible, leaning into the edge of possibility. And if we're just telling ourselves things that are true, we are just gonna stay in our reality. We're not gonna stretch our boundaries a little bit more. So my mentality is a little bit different from this and how affirmations do work for you is you tell yourself things which are 100% true. And he does go on to say that gratitude helps. And I 100% believe in that. Gratitude has been one of my practices as well. But what is really, really important that he mentions is you've got to address it somatically. You've got to address it somatically. I keep saying this so many times for people, okay? You can't just do a gratitude practice thinking, oh, I'm thankful for today and, you know, ah, I'm virtue signaling to the world and I'm so grateful today. Oh, I'm so grateful. You're still not in gratitude, my friend. You're not, you're not feeling it through your heart center and emanating and glowing with that gratitude. Like, ah, thank you, man. Like that is absolute gratitude, right? It may not look like that right now, but having a gratitude practice really, really feeling into and find, finding the senses, the sensory appreciation for it and that link so you can embody that gratitude into yourself thank you for mentioning that steve gratitude also alters the negativity bias that a lot of us have gratitude also lowers anxiety mindfulness mindfulness of course is crucial you guys know this if you're on this channel as well Stephen recommends mindfulness at least five minutes a day and there's two types of mindfulness one is a single pointed one which is more about focusing on something and the other one is an open senses meditation where you're kind of just like allowing whatever needs to happen to happen. You don't have one sense of focus, but you're kind of letting your thoughts do its own thing. And maybe you're just focusing on just all of it, your breathing, your everything about it, right? So it's more open senses, just being sensitive to what you're seeing, feeling, touching, etc. But the other one is like focusing on a mantra, focusing on a candle, focusing on, you know, your breath, focusing on your internal object or something and the object of your virtue or something like this, right? Again, fear, man, like Laird Hamilton, this book, he says that fear, it's what you choose to do with that fear that makes the difference, right? The surfer, Laird Hamilton. I, I think I, I love that, man. It's like what you choose to do with that fear, right? You can feel fear and run away, you can flee, you can fight, you can freeze. But what if we use fear as motivation, as fuel, as a way to move forward, as a, as a guidance system? Because for a lot of peak performance, this is our internal GPS, as described by this book, okay? This is our compass. Fear is our compass. If we're interested in impossible, we're interested in challenges. If we're interested in challenges, we're gonna get scared, okay? Challenges can be scary. Let's, let's just admit that fact, okay? You're gonna get hit with a lot of challenges if you're on this process. But that's the fun part, man. Challenges are fun. I like challenges. Let, hey, put me to the test. I got this. Let's go. Okay, that's the mindset. Ulmer, a female skier. Uh, I'm just going to call her Ulmer, as, as mentioned in the book. She mentions that to notice the fear in the body, to do it despite fear, to do it because of fear. Treat your fear like a playmate. I love that quote. Fear is not a problem to be solved. It's a resource to be savored. Another great quote. These are my takeaways, right, guys? I'm like, ah, these, I hear these little golden nuggets and I'm like, pow. Oh, I got to share it with someone now. I got to share it with my YouTube audience right now, okay? <laughs> For peak performers, fear is like a directional arrow. We go into it. They can't even get in. We get in, okay? Then, of course, there's this example of flooding or sensory 
desensitization, as they call it, like slowly getting yourself into the fear. Like, you know, you won't, like I'm, I would be personally afraid of water, so I'd like put in one toe first and then finally put in the foot. And then for, as the foot, I put in the, you know, the, the other part of the leg and, and it goes from there, right? I'm gonna suddenly drop my entire thing and just drop into the deep end. No, I, I slowly guide myself into the water. I give myself presence. I give myself engagement. I slowly lean into my fear. I slowly lean into the edges of the unknown and I learn to love the unknown. So fear amplifies attention. It's also a flow trigger. Fear follows that focus and focus is flow. So start to understand this very, very deep concept. We are turning and transforming, transmuting the fear into flow. That's been the whole process of what I'm doing and what I stand for as a walking embodiment on this planet. I truly, truly believe I'm here to spread this message. Now, of course, there's a dark side of grit. One of my clients the other day, uh, let's call him S, he was experiencing a lot of burnout symptoms. And you know, with burnout, there's usually three symptoms. Exhaustion, cynicism, and depression, all together. When you are going through this, you need some kind of an active recovery protocol, okay? Now there's a lot of examples given in this book from Steven, obviously you can take it to that peak performance edge by you know, doing some type of cryotherapy or, or saunas, which reduces cortisol according to him. Dark, cold rooms, no screens, delta wave, deep sleep, you know, hyperbaric chambers and nutritional specialists and sensory deprivation tanks and restorative yoga and tai chi and hot soap tubs and saunas and Epsom salt baths and red light infrared saunas to lower cortisol, like all this stuff, man, you know. Then he talks about ferocity, the habit of ferocity, creating a habit of that. Ferocity helps us maximize our 24 hours in the day. It lowers our cognitive load and it automizes our ability to lean in. So it saves us that energy and time of, for that like implementation velocity type thing, right? Of like, oh, I'm waiting, I'm in this limbo, I'm stuck. No, ferocity is just like, ah, go for it. So when people ask you, what are you working on? And the list that tumbles out of your mouth just surprises you and them both. That's when you have ferocity. I think that's a lovely way to sum this up. This was part one. I hope you got value from this video. Give it a thumbs up, share it. Shout out to the Flow Research Collective team. Appreciate you guys and what you're doing. Let's make the world a better place. Let's tap in. May the flow be with you and stay legendary. Hit that subscribe button. Let's go. Oh.